Welcome to another edition of Radio Renaissance, and I'm here as usual with my guest, Paul Kersey. And like every week, it's been a week just bursting to the gills with interesting developments having to do with race and race relations and immigration. Every week, it's like Christmas. There's always something exciting to talk about. And I think the first topic that we'd like to discuss is the man who may have the inside track to head the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, namely Keith Ellison. Those of you who are not familiar with him, he has been in Congress for 10 years. He represents the 5th Congressional District of Minnesota, and he is the first Muslim who was ever elected to Congress. There's a second now, you know. Well, you probably remember how big of a fuss they made about this, Jared, because I believe he requested Thomas Jefferson's Quran to be uh, to be sworn in, as if this was some symbolic gesture. Of course, we all know why Jefferson had a Quran. That was to study what was going on in Tripoli to try and understand the enemy, the Barbary pirates. It exactly. wasn't it wasn't about adulation for for Islam or or, or Muslims, but it was to understand where they were coming from and their motivations. That's exactly right. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a two-volume Quran, and they dredged it up from the rare book collection in the Library of Congress, and uh, <laughs> he was the first man to swear, be sworn into Congress with his hand on Thomas Jefferson's sure enough Bible. But he was raised Catholic, you know. Were you aware of that? I was aware of that. And uh, he said at one point, he says, I looked at what might inform social change, justice in society, and I found Islam. So that was his big motivation. He wanted a religion. I suppose it was going to go with his black sentiment of wanting social change. Well, one of the interesting things about him now, of course, is the columns that he wrote as a law student under the name of Keith Hakim, which have been coming out now. And uh, uh, I'll read from one uh, at some length here. But before I do that, I think it was interesting. In one of them, he said that the U.S. Constitution is, quote, the best evidence of a white racist conspiracy to subjugate other peoples. Uh, I mean, if you really wanted to find something that was about subjugating other peoples, you think you'd find something better than the U.S. Constitution, for heaven's sake. But that's his you would way. think so. Yes, that's his way of characterizing the Constitution. But... My favorite of all the essays by him that have been dug up is one that he wrote under the name of Keith Hakim in 1990. And uh, I'll read a selection from it. He's, he's talking about how he wants reparations from white people to black people and, then this is the best part, a country just for blacks. He says, whites would be relieved of the burdens of the black-faced but white-dominated social programs. Blacks would employ themselves, teach their own children the truth, and control their own neighborhoods. Black-white interaction would be voluntary instead of compelled. No more busing, no more affirmative action, and best of all, no more white guilt. White people could righteously say they have settled their debts with blacks. And think of it, whites could reclaim their cities without dispossessing anyone. Wow. End quote. <laughs> yes. I, Who could ask for more than that? Well, he has a better grasp on black-white relationship in the United States than anyone who has a sinecured position on Fox News or uh, the as a pundit. I mean, his, yes. his take right there is there's nothing that I can find objectionable about what he just said. The only thing I don't care for is he would do this after they'd shaken us down for probably about a million dollars ahead of blacks. But in any case, once we have parted ways, this is exactly the society that we're asking for. It is. <laughs> and, and this is, again, when you hear people question and say, oh, it would be so bad. I think I saw where, where uh, Alan Dershowitz talked about how horrible this would be for the DNC. I, you know, I could see why you'd say that. However, from my point of view... I think that this is where the DNC is headed. They made the case during the election cycle against Trump that it was all about the... Basically, the DNC thought that they had the election in the bank, in the tank. They thought that, hey, this is this, Clinton's going to win because we're on the right side of history, the browning of America. You're, you're, you get what's coming to you. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of rhetoric they're using. And now with Ellison in place, what's funny is that he's actually... What he's written is an offering to... Kind of escape the what what you know the coming the coming insanity that we see. I mean, 
if you look at what's happening all across the country in major cities, the division, the 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 disunity, the just the fact that a lot of these cities they rely so much on federal government uh, grants to even stay afloat. But the trouble, the trouble is, of course, he's backing away from all of this stuff. He says, <sighs> he, I was young. This was way back in 1990. I didn't mean it. Oh, Keith, come on. Please mean it. <laughs> in, in any case. I agree. Uh, yeah, no, he, he, had, he had a kind of interesting career. He started in the Minnesota State House before he got elected to Congress. And he had a very colorful history of not paying parking tickets or his income tax. The IRS finally put a lien on his house in order to get his money. And he's always filing his campaign finance statements late. He got in trouble for pocketing money that was supposed to go to the campaign. In other words, he is your typical black elected official. I, I have to ask, wouldn't your state house salary be uh, put in your bank account as... You know, you're obviously a W-2 employee, so wouldn't your income tax already be taken out? I mean, that's the, that, that's the kind of stuff that doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's like, what? <laughs> I think, well, yeah, it's, it's a good question. No, he just did not pay his taxes for several years in a row. I mean, uh, they say, well, that's the white man's problem, you know. But uh, then, uh, yes, as a congressman, he just kept this stuff up. Uh, but the interesting thing is I looked up his, his Minnesota district. And I assumed that because he's black and we hear about all of these Somalis living in Minnesota, it's an urban, it's an urban district. I assumed it's going to have a huge population of Somalis. But it is 63.5% white, even now. And he was first elected 10 years ago. It must have been even whiter then. 80, uh, no, I'm sorry, 18.2% black, 5.2% Asian, 9% Hispanic, 1.6% Indian, and 3.2% other. But two-thirds white, and they're still electing this guy. The last time he was elected, apparently, he got something like 70, 80%. He got a huge percent of the vote. Well, think about what the, what the uh, those are probably all Swedes who were in that area, Nordic, Nordic uh, Americans uh, in that 5th Congressional District. And you think about what their racial brothers and sisters are doing over in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, where they were in Sweden, they basically allowed uh, the country of what, 11 million to be colonized by even a greater proportion of non-Swedes than Germany let in last year. You know, Germany's a country of 83, 84 million people. They let in 1 million. Sweden's let in about 1 million, and they're only about 11 million people. Right. So you realize that there is some sort of unfortunately residue that is genetically passed down and that's the only thing jared that i can think of to justify why they would elect someone like ellison to represent them white people especially in those places that didn't grow up with non-whites the people all they know about about black people is what they read about them in time magazine <laughs> and so they think of course that they are absolutely wonderful and like all northerners when they read about what was going on in the south they always said to themselves oh we won't be like those bad Southerners. We're going to be so nice to these black people, and they're going to be just like us, and they're going to love us. That was really clearly their attitude, and now they've got this guy who might be head of the DNC. Yeah. In any case, uh, you know, there is some objection to him, but not because he is particularly anti-black, but now the problem for him is he apparently is anti-Semitic. He said that, uh, according to the ADL, he made a disqualifying remark in 2010 when he seemed to be saying that the pro-Israel forces have a disproportionate effect on American foreign policy. Now, uh, Congressman Ellison is now saying that he meant to complement the effectiveness of pro-Israel activist organizations. Well, uh, Haim Saban is not buying that. He's that billionaire. He says, Keith Ellison would be a disaster for the relationship between the Jewish community and the Democratic Party. But, interestingly enough, Chuck Schumer of New York says he's a great guy. So What's funny about Saban, uh, who is the, uh, he made his money with Power Rangers, uh, as, as Steve Saylor likes to always point out, that's where his fortune comes from. Last year after the attacks in Paris, uh, him who is, who, is, who, is, who is a Jewish American, who uh, I think he was born in Egypt, I, I don't remember where he was born, but he does have dual citizenship. He said it's, it might be time that we rethink our relationship with Muslims after the Paris attack. And I've always thought that that is, that's a very important point to come from someone as influential and important as Sabin, who, 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 who could be an ally down the road for Europeans as, 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 as Jews living in Europe, Jews in America realize and have to, 
they're forced to rethink the open borders policy and how disastrous that really is um, for, for for not just Americans and Europeans, but for, for Jews themselves. Well, I agree. Uh, he's uh, famous for having said, uh, I'm a one-issue guy, and my issue is Israel. Well, if he cares about Israel surrounded by this sea of hostile Arabs and Muslims, he should care about Jews living in the West yeah. who are increasingly being surrounded by hostile Muslims. So, yes, I think there's uh, clearly a move in the right direction. But uh, he certainly doesn't want Keith Ellison in uh, uh, running the DNC. Now, uh, another interesting thing about Ellison is that he has been supporting Farrakhan for years. You know, L Jesse Jackson denounced Farrakhan way back in 1984. He called it a he called Farrakhan reprehensible and morally indefensible when Farrakhan described Judaism as a gutter religion. But uh, right, right clear up to the Million Man March, uh, uh, Ellison was organizing for him, really or, uh, getting things going and trying to make that a big success. And he has called, uh, uh, he's called Farrakhan a tireless public servant of black people who constantly teaches self-reliance and self-examination to the black community. Uh, I'm all for that. Self-reliance, self-examination. Go to it, boys. Uh, the more I know about, the more I hear about Keith Ellison, the more I like him. Well, it almost makes you wonder if he understands that individual freedom requires individual responsibility when you hear that type of language and that collectively there are failings. You know, I've, I've actually read a lot of what Farrakhan has said the past couple of years because he famously came out with that, uh, oh, what was that hashtag? Um, it wasn't no justice, no peace, but it was a, it was a frightening militaristic uh, language they were began to use, but then I, I decided to look at some of the speeches, and they they are peppered with what you just said uh, of the praise. It is a self examination and and a reality that this is, of course, what modern liberalism can never allow to to have happen, and that is black people, black individuals are responsible for their actions. But you know, Louis Farrakhan really let me down in 1995. At the time of the Million Man March, when Keith Ellison was doing the organizing for him, you know, helping him get the buses together and get the, all the brothers together on the mall, I thought, wow, this is Louis Farrakhan's big moment. And I hoped, I hoped, and I assumed he was going to make the pitch for separation. That is part of the Nation of Islam's program. That is. If you look at, the, what is it, the final call, that's the name of their newspaper, mm -hmm. on the back page, there's this list of demands. They want reparations, and they want their own territory. And I said, okay, Louis, now is your chance. You've got the biggest audience you've ever had. Not one word about separation. Hmm. It was all about the mothership and the spaceship flying around and uh, all of this crazy stuff. I was really disappointed. And I think in his heart of hearts, Louis Farrakhan realizes he is much better living with white people, keeping whitey on the hop rather than actually trying to do the really difficult work of establishing his own country. I bet at some level, guys like Farrakhan, probably Ellison too, realize that if, they was, if they're really on their own, Haiti. Well, look at it this way. There are how many cities across the country that white people long ago built and white people long ago fled and that blacks have been in complete control of since uh, political control of both both elected and appointed public positions. And if there was one city that was thriving, if there was one county that had seen growth, you could say, okay, well, maybe there's hope if there is separation. But a guy like Farrakhan, a guy like Ellison, you know what? They are, they are incredibly intelligent guys who have built, uh, in the case of Farrakhan, a... In, really enviable organization. I mean, they're hosting massive speeches at, uh, you know, 30,000 seat arenas right. multiple times a year and they're sellouts and they're, you know, every seat is taken. And um, I mean, gosh, on our side, and this is not criticism, but I mean, could we even fill a, <laughs> it's not criticism, but it's yes. being, it, it's being self-reflective. And yes. You're right about, about Farrakhan, where he understands where his bread is truly buttered. I think so. I think so. I think they must realize that on their own, they just could not do it. Well, even, if, even if we gave them a parting gift of, 
$100,000 a piece, $500,000 a piece. They'd go through that like a hot knife through butter, and they'd be back in the bread line again. In 2015, uh, the elite celebrated the 50th anniversary of the a Bloody Selma, the March Across the Selma Bridge. And there was this amazing quote from Jesse Jackson where they were upset about all the white businesses leaving. And he said, we need to find a way to put pass a law that doesn't allow them to leave and take their capital with them. And there's an even more revealing quote from John Lewis. John Lewis, of course, is he's made his name as a, a long-term congressman who also just had a naval ship, even though he didn't serve in the Navy, named after him because I guess he sunk white civilization in the South. But he admitted, John Lewis admitted that Selma was one of the more bustling economic cities in all of Alabama and all of the South when they decided to declare war and what happened. And of course, Selma... Uh, I believe in the late 80s, they finally elected their first black mayor, and it, it's now an 80% black city where Jesse is upset that white people still have the freedom to close up their businesses and seek, uh, seek a more vibrant and economically uh, diverse area than the 80% black city that is sinking in its own uh, well, lack of genetic potential. Got to stop that. Got to stop those whites running away. But, you know, it, uh, it's out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. Uh, there, there's a great article some years ago in American Renaissance written by a white guy who taught at a black school. It was a black uh, junior high school, I think. And uh, he used to joke around with the kids about uh, black people and white people. And they really understood more than you'd give them credit for. And once he asked them, hey, uh, it was all black school. Yeah, uh, he'd say, uh, you know, what would it be like for you folks if there were no more white people? The first guy gets up and shout. He says, "We screwed." <laughs> they get it. They no, get they it. they they totally get it, and I, especially I think, people in yeah. positions of leadership. And and going back to Ellison and the importance, this really is a turning point in American history. The reaction by the left, and this is sort of why we wanted to even bring up Ellison, where the DNC is headed. You know. Donald Trump really did win the election because of the white vote. Uh, you look at the states that were so important to Donald Trump to win. Arizona, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. He had to reach out to people in those states, especially a place like Arizona, where I believe the electorate is now down to, from 1990, it was 75% white. It's close to about, it's almost a major, majority minority state. So he had to win. So much of the white vote, like you see in a place like Georgia, and, and even Georgia now. I mean, Georgia is a a wonderful state that now is much like Virginia because the federal government decide, has decided to declare war on on Georgia by placing as many refugees as possible. I mean, you go to Atlanta, it's like, where am I? But the point is, Donald Trump really did win by going to these Democrats and, and the Rust Belt and, and giving them a better vision of the future than what the Democrats did. They just ignored him completely. Now you appoint someone like Keith. You know, most of the white people in the Midwest are not like the uh, individuals who live in the 5th Conditional District. They're just not. You have the opportunity now here with Keith Ellison as the DNC head to basically make the Rust Belt firmly in the camp of Trump's new Republican Party by this symbolic gesture. Oh, I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I am rooting for him just as hard as I can. Nothing would make it clearer than the fact that they have got appointed this guy, especially after the press secretary to Democratic presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, whose name is also Sanders, Sim Simone or Simone Sanders. She says on CNN, and this is talking about why she wants Keith Ellison to be the head of the DNC. She says, we don't need white people leading the Democratic Party right now. I'm here for the millennials and the brown folk. Well, boy, that is just what we want more and more white voters to hear. They don't want white people leading the party. Now, in a way, they've got a strange and interesting logic there because, after all, their magic Negro, Barack Obama, he won twice in a row. And what is it, about 300 counties that went for Barack Obama, this time flipped and right. went for Donald Trump. That's right. So in a way, there's a certain logic to it to say, okay, our guy won. Your, your woman, your white woman, she was a complete flop. But 
I think this sends such an unmistakable message to say we don't even want white people around. And this is just going to further the division of the United States into the Republicans being the de facto white people's party. Now, it remains to be seen if they've got the brains to realize that and act on that. But at least this makes it crystal, crystal clear. Well, not only does it make it crystal clear, but you go back to some of the rhetoric that we've heard from people like Joe Biden and from Tim Kaine during the election cycle. They were both cheering on the browning of America, white people losing their place, and how this was going to be uh, a wonderful thing for the country. Although, again, there is no empirical evidence that the that uh, the loss of white population and the increase of non-white population brings about some sort of magical nirvana. There's not one city in the country where this has taken place where you can look and see the uh, metrics measuring um, social uh, the social life has increased. There, there's not one. If there is one city, I would love to see it. Miami doesn't count. <laughs> well, my, Miami does count. It's just as bad as the rest. The <laughs> one, the one perhaps counter example that you could come up with is Honolulu. Honolulu is pretty heavily Asian. And it has a pretty low crime rate. Uh, uh, there's a lot of welfare. Some of these Samoans and this, that, and the other. But it's a pretty livable place. It's one of those rare places that has a, a rather small white minority, but where white people actually want to go live. It is the one exception to when I ask people, well, can you name a majority non-white neighborhood or majority white majority non-white city you'd like to live in? They can't. Well, if they're really smart, if they've been around, they might say Honolulu, but that's because it's overwhelmingly Asian. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, uh, be all that as it may, the, uh, aside from Keith Ellison, and as I say, I am rooting for Keith. Go, Keith, baby. I want you. I want you, and I want you to be in front of the cameras as often as possible, saying all of these wonderful things at every opportunity. But the other piece of interesting news this week was uh, the debunking of the SPLC's claim of, what did they say, that there had been uh, 867 alleged anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and anti-black hate crimes in just the 10 days following Trump's election. I mean, all those white people just filled with Trumpomania and hatred went out and did all these horrible things to all these people. But as we now know, this 867, those were collected without any confirmation on the part of the SPLC, simply by often anonymous people who posted them on their internet site. They were not asked, what, was, what horrible thing was done to you today? What's funny is I remember when I saw this, I think The Hill had an article about this, and they're like, uh, this is horrible what's happening. And from an inverted pyramid style, you would think that one of the more important aspects of the, this study, and I, and I use quotations when I say study, would be the fact that they didn't independent, independently confirm the authenticity of these claims. Well, that was buried in the last paragraph of The Hill story. Right. So if your eyes, if you just scan over this, your confirmation, your confirmation bias kicks in. We knew when Trump got in, we'd see these this hate come manifest itself because we saw it during the election. You know, the media was right. This this is dark times. What Donald Trump is doing is ushering in this new dark era for American politics. It's awful. It's evil. Yep. But it's all false. Yep. Well, all of these, uh, you, Jared, more and more of these hoaxes because of websites like uh, like Breitbart. Or the New York Post, which I believe published Paul Sperry's excellent analysis on on uh, on this on this ho hoax, which we're going to get to in a second. But you have so many websites now that they don't wait for or they don't buy into a story that comes out that hasn't been independently verified. I mean, you go back and you think about all those hoaxes that happened after the election where some Muslim or some black American said something horrible happened to them. It turns out they did it themselves. You know, we still haven't had the FBI release what happened down at that church in the 75% black area of Mississippi where the church was burned or the, where the vote Trump's uh, graffiti was on it. You know, you have to wonder at this point, you know, A, I don't think I've ever met someone who would, who would voluntarily go off and, and harass someone like that because they'd face a long, a long time in jail. They, they would be aware of the damning ramifications. But you know what? Conversely... The SPLC is well aware that there aren't any ramifications for publishing a study like this because they already have, you know, they've been working hand in hand with the government for how long crafting policy. They've been working hand in hand with teachers unions across the country for how many years. And they have a sympathetic media that will promote the most 
minute claim that they can come out with in a press release as 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 uh, almost biblically grounded as if it came from God. That's right. They knew perfectly well that the Washington Post and New York Times and all their other friends were going to publish this as if it were gospel truth. And uh, another thing that got published and widely circulated was a different study that they did right about the same time. This was based on surveys. And the title of this study was called The Trump Effect, the Impact of the 2016 Presidential Election on Our Nation's Schools. And what it did was it surveyed all of these left-leaning school teachers (laughs) to ask if any of their students had had derogatory language directed at them because they were people of color or Muslims or immigrants or based on gender or sexual orientation. And they said uh, 40% of the teachers came back in and said, yes, 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 I've seen, I've seen that done. Well, as it turns out, in their actual initial questions, they wanted to know, have white children had any of this, uh, any of this unpleasant stuff said their way? And 20% of the teachers said, well, yes, white people too. Even these lefty teachers conceded that. But in their report, they left that completely out of their report. Any kind of derogatory comments against whites, that doesn't count. This is just extraordinary. In this era in which everybody is wringing their hands about false news, false news got Trump elected, these people are just absolutely shameless. Besides which, for the SPLC, if a white student walking by a Hispanic student simply says, build the wall, that is another example for them of a hate crime or hate speech. It is it is fascinating, and I do encourage everyone listening to this to check out the story, Report Buried Trump-Related Hate Crimes Against White Kids, published by the New York Post on December 5th. And, I mean, that first paragraph of the story, I mean, again, the SPLC deliberately buried the results that came from more than 2,000 educators from the survey they put out. And what's fascinating is, of course, the survey is the teaching tolerance. And the fact is that it couldn't be farther from the truth. It's basically teaching conformity to the notion that only white people can be racist, that only white people have. And again, one of the more important things to point out now is that the media only a year ago was triumphant in the fact that K through 12 public schools are now nationwide, majority non-white. That's right. And you look at the, the fact that the SPLC would willingly censor, would willingly um, work to uh, to hide these findings that more than 2,000 educators noted anti-white bias after the Trump election. This does not bode well for for some dreamy utopian view of the future when white people are have lost all positions of power. In fact, it reminds me of what we're seeing in South Africa where you know some of the youth leaders of the ANC or uh, I don't remember which acronym it is, but they're they're saying, "Oh, now's not the time to talk about genocide of the whites. That'll come." This is, I mean, again, history is our guide. And you mentioned earlier San Domingo, Haiti. I mean, history doesn't change. It's always going to turn out to be, uh, regrettably, the same scenario. And white people continue to believe that if we just if we just give up more and more and more this time, then we'll be left alone. See, it's human nature that doesn't change. And that is the crazy thing about liberals. They think they have unlocked the key that they can change human nature. In fact, many of them don't believe there is even such a thing as human nature. We're completely blank slates. And if we wrap our arms around these Somalis who don't speak English and who've never used a flush toilet, and if we, in, if we say the magic incantation of welcome to America, they're going to be just like you and me. It is, it is this almost religious fervor of believing in the utterly unbelievable that's behind all this. Which, of course, leads us to the fact that we are not alone in our folly. Our German cousins, this is such a sad story. You know, and, and, and before we can, let's preface what, what's happened in Germany. Against the will of the German people, one million third worlders, primarily, primarily Muslims, so-called escaping their refugees, but as we know, that's not the case. They're all, of, they're all very few children. You know, we, we know the horror of what happened in Cologne and the fact that you had the media, the state media, the police, the government all colluding to deny and cover up what happened yeah. during the Cologne sex attacks on German women by these new arrivals to Germany. And 
We're well, talking about a million people. More than a million it's people. It's more than a million. It's about 1.3 million now. And most of them young men. Precisely the kind of people you do not want. I can't remember the, the, the fiduciary number that I saw, but I think that they were going to, this invasion, and it is an invasion, that's the only word you can use, was going to cost the German taxpayer well in excess of $60 billion per year to house, feed. And there was another study that showed virtually none of these people have any skills right. that, are, that can be useful for a 21st century economy. And even if they did, they don't speak German. Ah. It, it's insane. In any case, the sad, sad story of Maria Ladenberger, a 19-year-old girl. She used to volunteer in one of these refugee centers. And she's the daughter of a senior European Union official, a Dr. Clemens Ladenberger, who is, uh, works on the legal staff of the European Commission. Well, uh, she was going home from a party one night, and she was raped brutally, badly raped by a 17-year-old Afghan. And then she was thrown into the river while she was still conscious and alive where she drowned. Well, this is a sad enough story as it is, but what makes it particularly sad and particularly agonizing for any white people with any sense of race and destiny is that Dr. Clemens Ladenberger and her wife have urged at the time of the funeral that any contributions in lieu of flowers be made to an organization that is in the business of bringing in refugees from the Middle East and resettling them in Germany. They can think of nothing better to do in the memory of their murdered, raped, murdered, drowned daughter than to bring in yet more people like this Afghan who did this to them. This, to me, this is a uniquely white form of insanity. It is impossible for me to imagine a person of any other race behaving in this way. Agree completely. I, I think it's, as you noted, this guy was a senior EU commissioner, uh, official. He owes his position in life to his dedication to absolving Europe of Europeans. Looks that way. And, and he's that's great. why, and, and you have to understand, again... I've got a completely different take, and I, I'd like to, to state that this girl was working on behalf of the invaders. She was, you can't say brainwashed and inculcated. I don't think that's the right word. She grew up marinated in this type of world. Yes, she didn't have another opportunity. Yes, in Germany, the government is working with social media to try and crack down on anyone who's using this story as justification to ceasing the invasion of Germany. There being, you know, again, if you post a story about this on Facebook, you could be prosecuted and go to jail for a hate crime in Germany. Think about that for a second. Yeah. Not only is a is one of your countrymen dead because of this invader, but if you dare mention this as reason and rationale for stopping this insane policy, you'll go to jail. Now, I I got to be I got to be be completely blunt here. I I don't have much remorse for Maria or her family. They they owe their position and power in, 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 in the world and in Germany to their dedication to seeing Europeans, let's, let's put it blunt, to being absorbed by the third world. Well, see, I disagree with you here. And uh, this reminds me of a disagreement I had with a man uh, of whom I, whom I held in the highest regard, namely Sam Francis. And it was over a very similar case. It was the case of Amy Beale. Amy Beale, uh, those of you who are not old enough to remember, she was a white woman who went to South Africa. She went there in 1994. This was just before the all-race election that turned the country over to blacks. She was very active in registering blacks to vote because she wanted them to vote to overthrow white rule. Well, uh, once when she was driving some of her black friends back to their township, in Gugulethu, that was the township close to Cape Town, when a bunch of blacks who'd been out throwing stones at cars with white people in them and jeering at them and chasing them out of the neighborhood, they caught sight of her, a mob descended on her, they tore her out of the car, and they stabbed her, beat her to death with bricks while saying, one settler, one bullet. One settler was their way for describing white people. So, how did Amy Beale's parents react to this? They flew to South Africa. They publicly embraced 
the four convicted killers of this mob, they managed to find and track down and convict four. And they set up something called the Amy Beale Foundation, whose job it is to uh, gild the ghetto, turn uh, Africans into Europeans, make them good little liberals just like us. Now, in fact, the foundation even hired two of the killers. Uh, two of the others, they were convicted of rape, uh, a not an infrequent uh, thing that happens there, so they somehow disappeared. But two of her killers, they actually hired. Now, uh, as, uh, as, as you probably recall, I'm sure, uh, Brother Kersey, in 1998, the four killers, they were pardoned by South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission because it was held that their actions were politically motivated. And any politically motivated violence, even if it is tearing a poor white girl out of her car and stabbing her and beating her to death with bricks, that was considered a political motivation. Now, this is a long-winded way of getting back to my disagreement with Sam Francis. Sam Francis wrote a column in which he repeatedly referred to Amy Beale as a bubblehead. <laughs> he referred to her in the most contemptuous terms. Amy Beale was a young white girl, just like this 19-year-old Ladenburg girl. Uh, and I do not blame them for what they did. Most human beings, certainly at that age, are basically recipients. They receive what the culture and their parents and the media have poured into them. I'm sure that this 19-year-old Maria Ladenberger and Amy Beale could have grown up to be fine, upstanding white women, mothers of important, of, of mothers of, lar of large numbers of children. And this happened to them because of their environment. I cannot blame them. And I think it's harsh to blame them. You may, you may be right to blame their parents. Their parents have been around longer. But the girls themselves who were killed, I, I just grieve over them. I think that's a terrible tragedy to our race. And they individually, I find them very, very difficult to blame. I think I was in the fourth grade when the election happened in South Africa. So I have vague recollections of watching on CNN that was pumped into our schoolroom every Friday about how great this was going to be, about how this election was going to bring about true democracy to South Africa and to the long discriminated and uh, disenfranchised uh, South Africans. And then when you learned about Amy Beale, again, it was it was her decision to go down there, but when you realize that her family hired the killers, I mean, you're right to, to question if any other race would would uh, produce individuals with that kind of indecency. I, I, this might be the only word I can think of to describe what Beale's parents mm -hmm. did there. Just how how their daughter was was killed, and and, and the one thing that um, that is important to note is that. During the trial of those of those blacks in South Africa uh, for for Amy Beale's death, that uh, supporters of the three accused of murdering her burst out laughing in the public gallery of the Supreme Court when a witness told how they battered the woman, how when they battered uh, Amy Beale, she groaned in pain, and the lack of empathy. You know, the thing I've read a lot of stories about when. These Muslim invaders in Germany and uh, in Sweden, when they're when they're actually taken to court, the few times that they are, they'll do the same thing. They'll laugh. They're mocking the laws that restrict freedom of the actual European people. That will again going back to the fact of is the fact of if Germans dare note the death of Maria Ladenberger on their Facebook social media, they risk being imprisoned. What does that tell you? Are you sure simply noting it? I think if they then say, and for this reason, we need to keep these swine out, I think that can get them in. Well, it can. And that's what I'm saying. It, justifying yes. and then using the language of yes. removal. using right. the, Because again, the fact is that her parents, they're still working. Ladenberger's parents are still working to remove Europeans from their native soil. The indigenous Europeans, this is... this. Well, 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 well. We don't know exactly. I mean, he's on the legal staff. You know? Well, he's we on the legal exactly. staff, but again, he's it's in a... lieu of flowers, donate to, right. this, to this cause. And this is, this my, is sick. My question for you is, you know, you've been working, uh, American Renaissance has been around since, I think, uh, 1990. When you read stories like, like the, what happened to Amy Beale and then this, this Ladenberger girl, I mean, what, 
what do you feel? What what do you think? I mean, because these are people of positions of power. These are people of respect who basically exist to see the dispossession of their own people. What it makes me think is how many more murders would there have to be? It's like the same thing, I think, when people talk about uh, Muslim terrorism. And all of the lefties say, no, 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 it's just a small number. And this does not reflect on all Muslims. How many would have to die? Yeah. How many? 500? 1,000? 5,000? 20,000? How many would it take? I mean, at some point, surely, even the most blinkered, mad lefties would arrive at some conclusion and say, okay, that's enough. I'd just be curious to know how much is enough for them. Or maybe there's no figure that's enough. Because I genuinely don't think that they get up in the morning, they rub their hands, and they say, okay, what are we going to do today to <laughs> reduce the number of white people? I don't think they think in those terms. They really think that they're bringing about a new world in which race is not going to be a matter and we're all going to love each other. I mean, if they really do think, okay, how are we going to eliminate white people? Then there is no limit. You know, the more of us that kill, the better. But I honestly don't think they think that way. But last point about Amy Beale. Amy Beale has been immortalized. There is now an Amy Beale High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, named after Amy Beale. There is an Amy Beale Community School in Rancho Viejo in Santa Fe. So she has gone down in history as a saint. Uh, you know, when the, when the Catholic Church runs out of saints, you know, maybe that's somebody they can think of, can consider canonizing. You know? Well, of course, those schools are only going to stick around for the time being until the Reconquista is confirmed, and then those schools are completely renamed. Some, So uh, there, is a silver, there is a silver lining in this that, yes, the Beals uh, sacrificed their daughter, and then Europeans, of course, sacrificed their, their states uh, to the cause of, of you know, uh, removing whites from any source of political power. That's right. I think white people, by, by naming a school after this woman, they are, in, in effect, currying favor with non-whites. They're memorializing this person who gave her life for black rule, basically, yeah. what it boils down to. White people think that the non-whites are going to be grateful. They have no understanding. They have no understanding. Again, and, and we can probably close on this. This is a question to you. You're a student of history. Is there an example and known history of a people doing what whites across the world are doing right now? No. It's unprecedented. Unprecedented. Conquest always heretofore has required a stronger, more vigorous, aggressive, better armed, more militant people who fight their way into their new territory. This is the first time that a majority of people, a dominant people, have simply said, take it. It's yours. In any case, it's our job to stop that, Brother Kersey. And uh, I think uh, we are heading a little bit in that direction. I, I think we are too. And, um, you know, in closing, Christmas is coming up. I was wondering if there was anything that you wanted uh, to offer the listeners uh, in regards to some of the fantastic products you guys have for sale at the American Renaissance uh, uh, store. Well, of course. We have uh, our wonderful selection of books. Uh, Why Race Matters by Michael Levin. We have uh, Samuel Francis's great book, The Essential Writings of Samuel Francis on Race. It's a nice, slim volume. I think it's one of the, it's one of the most successful books that we offer. Uh, we also have uh, Race and Reason by Carlton Putnam. Did you ever read Carlton Putnam's Race and Reason? I have. I read that yes. uh, a couple years ago. It is, it is, it is just is... as fresh today as when it was written back in, what, 1964, I think is when it was written. It's a stunning book because yes. that was one of the first times, uh, uh, except for a conversation with Peter Brimlow, where he wrote a lot about restrictive covenants and about the deleterious effects of Shelley versus Kramer. And it never really... That's one of the core cases you don't really ever hear or think about. But to me, when you go back and actually look at what the NAACP and their allies did for 30 years to destroy restrictive covenants, that was what they built the entire basis of the NAACP to bring down was the ability for municipalities and for private citizens to have control over their own private right. property, which is the basis of freedom of association. That's and right. after reading Putnam's book, it, it put it all into perspective. And that, that I agree, that is... That's fresh, concise, and, and a really vigorous account mm -hmm. of, of the situation we, we find ourselves in. Yes, yes. Some truths never grow stale.
In any case, well, thanks so much for listening, and we will look forward to speaking to you again next week, and uh, have a wonderful Christmas season.